So, hello everybody. Um, my name is Chris Bingham. I'm a solutions architect at Mirantis in Europe. Uh, so, you come back from holiday, and the boss tells you that as part of a new strategic initiative to uh, maximize market penetration, increase brand loyalty, and enhance intangible assets, you, the company requires you to deploy and cloud. So you do some research. Maybe you attend a conference, and then you deploy and cloud, and the boss declares victory. And everything's fine for a couple of months until somebody inconveniently asks, where are all those uh, efficiencies? Where are all those benefits for cloud, promise me? The boss is unhappy. Strategic initiative plows on regardless. And politics takes over. So this may be a very familiar story if you've worked in enterprise or enterprise projects in general. Uh, and a big part of my job is working to prevent this sort of thing from happening, to make sure that enterprise cloud projects succeed. So why do enterprise cloud projects go sideways? Well, in my experience, it's usually due to fractured perspectives, a failure to build a common understanding of where the benefits enterprises seek from cloud actually come from. Because of the uh, siloed, competency-based organizational structures enterprise IT departments typically have, our management tend to focus on the shiny new tech, whilst our customers in the business tend to focus on things like the how cool it would be to have super fast deployments. And we in the IT department are stuck in the middle. So in order for our cloud projects to succeed in the enterprise, we as the IT team need to communicate to stakeholders where the benefits they seek actually come from and build that common understanding. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So next I'm going to give you a quick TLDR version of how I've approached this in the past, um, taken from a talk I've given at our customer at Marantis Volkswagen a few times over the past few months. So to begin with, we have to establish why cloud. So cloud fundamentally is not a, um, <laughs> this is where I forget my lines. Uh, apologies. So cloud is an approach for solving a specific type of problem. It's for solving uh, problems that require very high scalability, but require exceptional levels of availability and resilience. And then we look at why, uh, what are some of the key attributes of a cloud application. So cloud applications are built to be scalable and elastic. And to do this, they're composed of microservices, components that do one thing very well. Microservices are loosely coupled. They interact via defined APIs and can change at different rates. Microservices are horizontally scaled. In capacity is increased or decreased by changing the running number of e number of running instances of each microservice independently. And horizontal scaling requires parallel processing. Multiple instances of each microservice processing requests concurrently. It's also important to look at failure differently. Failure, I say to our customers, is not something to be afraid of. It's just a fact of life. If failure isn't an option, we can only do things that we already know will work. And that means doing the same things we've always done before over and over again. However, entropy and technical debt guarantee that old successful approaches will fail given enough time. So as the Mythbusters taught us, failure is always an option. So what's the first practical step an enterprise can take toward cloud? The real benefit of cloud is not cost savings, it's agility. It's the ability to change things and to respond to the market in hours instead of months. And key to this is escaping the lengthy process obstacle course of infrastructure procurement. In order to achieve this, it's necessary to start defining the infrastructure as code. The cloud can then use this code to auto-magically build entire complex application stacks rapidly and repeatedly. And once our infrastructure is code, we can version control it. This means that our, the definition of our infrastructure for our enterprise application can live in a single repository with the code for that application, 
making that one repository or set of repositories the single definitive source of truth. This also enables old versions of uh, applications and their whole stacks to be redeployed at any time in the future. If, for example, required for an audit. So now that all of our infrastructure is code and everything's version controlled, how do we use this foundation to accelerate the delivery of business value? The thing our customers are really looking for. CICD, thoroughly implemented, can hugely speed up the realization of business value from IT. Because ultimately, IT only has value to the company when it's in our customers' hands. Otherwise, it's just inventory on the shelf taking up space and money. CICD is focused, I say to our customers, on optimizing for velocity, reducing the time it takes to go from need to production. And there are a few key steps to increasing velocity. The first is testing, lots and lots of testing. Because testing each change, each improvement we make, rapidly and thoroughly increases confidence. And confidence, having strong confidence in each change, is the, is the first prerequisite to increase in velocity. Crucially, this requires defining the acceptance criteria up front and in detail, because none of this testing is being done by humans. Reducing the number of things people have to do is the second prerequisite to increase in velocity. Arguably, our time as engineers, architects, coders, is the most valuable um, commodity the company has and the most finite. So as much of it as possible should be spent on things which build value, designing products or creating code. And once all of our code is, all, everything is automated and everything is version controlled, this enables a counterintuitive method to both increase velocity while also decreasing risk. Conventionally, enterprise IT systems are updated in big bangs. This happens because people naturally view change as risky, so try to minimize it. However, the riskier proposition is actually avoiding change, partly because it delays the realization of value from our work, but mainly because in any endeavor, the riskiest process is the one we exercise the least. Less change means less at practice at performing change, which increases the potential for risk. So cloud systems emphasize small, frequent changes. By avoiding batching changes together, testing is simplified, which increases confidence. Increased confidence enables fast, frequent change, and frequent change exercises the change process, which makes us better at performing change and thus delivering for business value. So where does that little TLDR version leave of that talk leave us? Well, the majority of the work, as Boris, our co-founder at Morantis, said this morning, 90% of the work in any enterprise cloud project is not the technology. It's changing how the team's affected work. Excuse me. It's building the organizational structures and processes centered around business units of business value, around platforms and applications, instead of around technical skill-based competency silos. It's building processes and procedures geared for one deployment a day rather than one deployment a year. And most importantly, it's looking at failure and risk in a different way to avoid the classic paralysis by analysis trap that so many enterprise IT projects get stuck in. And without all of those things, we're back to fail. So let's say you'd like to learn some more. Um, how much can you learn for 100 euros? Here's uh, five books I would recommend to help you bridge the gap between those stakeholders and build that common understanding to help your enterprise cloud projects succeed. So first up, The Phoenix Project. It's a, a very short but engaging read that gives a lot of context to what I've talked about today. 
Secondly, uh, migrating to cloud native application architectures. Uh, another short read that gives a good overview of the architectural changes that come with moving to a cloud application design. And best of all, it's free. The Practice of Cloud System Administration, Volume 2. Uh, so this one's a bit of a doorstep, uh, but it's well worth wading through. It goes into a lot of detail about the practices and the realities of running a successful cloud system. And along the way, gives a good insight into how roles and organizational structures can differ between the classic enterprise IT world and the cloud world. Architecting the cloud, design decisions for cloud computing service models. Uh, so this one I found to be particularly good for establishing communication up the chain of management and into the C-suite. I've often used this book in projects in the past as a touchstone for establishing a shared set of terminology and a shared conceptual understanding across multiple levels of a team as to what a cloud is and where the benefits come from. And last but not least, the big switch. So this book uh, gives a good wider context to the cloud discussion. Some of the comparisons it makes have become a bit cliched over the years, uh, but I still recommend it for expanding the discussion beyond pure technology. So there's the five books if you wanted to take a, a photo of them. <laughs> um, and with that, thank you very much for your time and do enjoy the rest of your summit.